my name is Mike Bell. Uh, I do it. So we've got HTML, CSS, images, JavaScript, everything that makes the page what it is. For the back end, we've got PHP and MySQL. So pretty much everything should be captured. So the next question is um, where to start on caching. Well, there's kind of the big important question is why is my site slow in the first place? Um, this user can be broken down into three distinct answers. Um, one, you've got bad code. Um, so if somebody's running some nasty DB queries on every page load that's slowing the site down, bad code. B, bad servers. Um, or C, it's not. So if it's bad code, first thing you need to do is just stop right there. Um, caching is going to help, um, but it's not going to solve the issues in the long run. Um, as sites get bigger, um, caching will help, but your problem is still there. And as more and more users hit your site, it's going to become more and more important. There are tools to help with this. Um, there's a tool called XAProf, um, which is a great tool for breaking down um, function timings um, within a uh, page load. It's brilliant because it tells you how long uh, PHP spends in a specific function, so you can see whether a function is taking 100 to 200 milliseconds to run. Um, usually, when you run it on Drupal, you'll see that um, the caching is turned off, and you'll see quite a lot of menu calls. <coughs> Bad server, again, stop. A lot of people that um, we see um, come to us and say, well, my site's really slow, and then we ask them where you're hosting. So normally then we hear the good answers of Fastos and other such hosting providers. So then the kind of question is, so how's 599 a month working out here? Um, again, caching will help, but still got bigger issues here. The good thing about servers is you can scale horizontally and vertically pretty quickly these days with cloud technology. So it is a fixable problem, but again, you should still address the bigger issues. Then there's the third type, which it's not, in which case I like people like you. Um, People that actively have good code bases and want to put caching in because they like having sites with some four hundred milliseconds load times. Um, caching is always a good thing, except when you have to deal with it, which is then it becomes difficult to talk about. So caching in Drupal, um, there are plenty of different ways to cache things. Um, Drupal provides its own caching API. Um, this can be the functions cache get and cache set. Um, these are meant to handle it. If you're a Drupal module developer and you have any data that is um, required repeatedly, I highly suggest you use these. Um, there's APC, which um, is just not get installed on Ubuntu. Um, I'm not going to cover that today. Um, resource caching, this kind of comes back to front end um, sort of resources stuff like uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, things like that. And database layer caching, um, which is also been very handy. And content distribution networks, um, kind of related to resource caching, but for bigger files such as video and audio, stuff that you probably wouldn't want being served off your own web server. So, code level. Drupal has its own caching API. Module developers should use it. If you're not, then I suggest you look into it. Um, cache set, uh, this stores data, um, data in Drupal's cache table. If anybody's looked at um, a Drupal database, you'll see lots of tables with cache of the scope and this is Drupal's caching API working. Uh, cache get is a way of getting that cache out. Um, the nice thing about this is you can actually um, define your own caching tables, um, so you don't have to stick with Drupal's normal cache um, tables. Uh, for example, views used as it, so uh, there's caching scott views, um, which is defined by the views module. Um, resource caching. There are many different types of resources on the site. Um, each can be cached by various different tools. Um, 
when you when you're looking at resource caching, it's kind of best to take a shotgun approach to it and just everything. Um, for example, Drupal actually has its own CSS and JS caching in the um, form of aggregated CSS and JS. It does minify things and it does cut page load times down, as well as helping ID browse. Um, Drupal's page cache um, is basically seen at many of these podcast tables. Um, there's the five modules such as Boost, um, which is a Drupal module that you can install. And there's tools like Varnish, um, which are server level um, tools. So this is just an example of um, Drupal's default and see this in JS and page caching. Um, this was taken from my own site as I was writing a caching presentation and then realized I don't even cache my own site, which is brilliant. Um, so, Boost. Um, Boost is a Drupal project. Um, it's, it's a Drupal module. You add it to your site and enable it in site so modules. Pretty much like any other module. Um, it provides a static cache for all Drupal assets. Um, again, what you'll find with the majority of these caching things, it's only really helpful for anonymous users. Um, for those that deal with authenticated users, caching could be a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's ideal for shared hosting environments. Um, so not everybody has access to root users on their boxes. Um, as long as you have some shell access, um, Boost is ideal um, because that can be easily configured. And out of all the um, caching systems that I'll be covering today, this is potentially the easiest to set up. Vanish. Um, Vanish isn't really a Drupal specific thing. It's, um, it's, it calls itself an application accelerator. So you can stick Vanish in front of a lot of things, not do it doesn't have to be Drupal specific, it just happens that there is a Drupal module for this and it's very handy. Um, it's Linux only, um, which shouldn't be an issue for most people. Um, it caches resources based on initial view. So what happens generally is a user requests a page. If the request goes to Varnish, if Varnish doesn't have that data in its cache, it will then pass it back to Apache. Apache then serves the content, which then Varnish caches. Um, again, it's not Linux only, although you can, it is insanely powerful. So you can actually get it to cache authenticated <coughs> stuff um, if you play around with VCLs. Um, Varnish is very picky with sessions. Um, and cookies tend to find that the majority of Drupal sites will work out of the box with Varnish um, because various third party modules do different things with sessions and cookies, in which case you then have to debug which module is holding the session rights and stuff like this and page load. I'll touch down briefly. Um, there's the advanced setup for Varnish. Um, it does require an additional module, which shouldn't be an issue. Um, you can have granular time to lips, which is really handy. Um, so if you have a brochure site that only gets content uploaded, say, once every day, then you don't need to worry about expiring cache on that site um, for at least 24 hours. On the flip side of that, you can put it in the site slot that are getting content published to it on a minute by minute basis, and you can still cache those. Um, any caching, whether even if it is for a short amount of time, you still do caching. Um, you can get very, very specific in its config um, using the um, VCL. Um, this is just a configuration file um, which goes in the um, install directory. Um, and from there, you can actually specify the page elements in the cache, um, which is very, very handy. Vanish comes with um, two types of cache store. Um, so a cache store is basically a file with the, um, it has two, uh, RAM and disk. RAM is super fast, but for larger sites you will require more memory. Um, 
I did some benchmarks on my own site um, using a 512 meg instance and I actually found it was quicker to not have varnish on there because I was using um, varnish as a RAM, right, using the RAM slot um, and Apache and varnish were fighting for resources constantly, so it's actually quicker not to have it on. So if you have servers with AK plus RAM, then disk, it's fast, it's not as fast as RAM, um, and most servers have hundreds of gigs of data these days, so <coughs> you can capture work. The next type of caching is uh, memcache. Um, this is again very much like Varnish, it's not specific to Drupal, it just happens that it works quite well with Drupal and there's um, good Drupal integration. Um, Mostly used for data and database caching. Um, it's kind of a cache for cache, if that makes sense. Um, so, a diagram of a typical memcache setup. So, you can use memcache on multiple servers and network them together to create a pool of resources. So, in this example, we have two servers, um, they all have 64 meg uh, memory for free. We then use memcache, pull them together, that gives us 120 meg of uh, caching store, which is available to any server that connects into it. Um, a good example of using memcache, by default, when you set it up and enable it, it will cache all core tables, so that's where the idea of caching cache comes from. Um, this means that all the you can run um, run cache on HA setups where you have multiple web files, multiple DBs, and then multiple memcache servers. Um, because it's shared, um, you can then pull that data from any web server um, without having to worry about it. The API for memcache is dead easy. Um, it's really nice to work with. And because of the API, you're not limited to just what one module gives you. Um, so if you have any custom login, it requires a Drupal extent. Um, it requires a Drupal module and a Drupal extension. Okay, um, moving on to third-party caching solutions. Um, I'm going to be covering Akamai and Cloudflare, um, two of the biggest um, providers. Although Cloudflare is currently down which is a big issue. Um, Akamai, it's one of the biggest caching providers in the world. Um, there is a high chance that you've experienced Akamai today, um, just <coughs> randomly browsing the internet without even realizing it. Um, again, it's a static cache of resources. Um, it then distributes <coughs> this data across um, hundreds of servers all around the world, which means that latency is rarely ever an issue. So if I'm in Japan, I will be hitting a Japan Edge server. I'm in the US, I'll be hitting whichever is the local US Edge server. So this minimizes latency across the entire network. The one thing with Akamai is because of um, the amount of Edge servers they have, is that once the central server gets the data, it then has to push it out. So it does take time for like, your initial content to be pushed to all those different end nodes. Another thing that Akamai provides is coverage for distributed mail service attacks. Um, they pride themselves on having sort of active monitoring and defense against this. If you look at the site, um, they actually display how many attacks are happening um, currently. Which is good. Um, <coughs> They have a really, really amazingly powerful um, control panel which allows you to do advanced redirect <coughs> rules. So you can, in theory, have um, a top level domain and then you can be pushing off various different um, subfolders or however you want to configure your site to different servers, different infrastructures, all that kind of stuff. The one downside to Akamai is it's not cheap. Um, it's very, very expensive, um, and they don't actually advertise any prices. Um, you have to call them up for a consultation where they'll come back to you with a tailored plan. <coughs> the good side to it is it's pretty magical. Um, it, having worked with it a lot recently, um, 
I'm very impressed with it. Um, Barflow, um, it's very similar to Black Knight on a slightly smaller scale. Um, they have an emphasis on security and um, DDoS protection, even more so than Black Knight, <coughs> although, like the default, Barflow is currently down. Um, so, moving on to content distribution networks. This is a relatively new thing over the past two to three years. Um, it's abbreviated to CDNs for short. This allows us to offload um, specific types of resources <coughs> to an external provider, um, such as images, video, audio, live files. Stuff where you don't want to be sharing, say, Two, three hundred meg video or audio files off your own server, off your own servers. If you're on a server that has a bandwidth quota, um, again, this allows you to syndicate content around the world. Um, many providers will do that by default, and this limits the latency again. And if you're in Japan, if you're in Japan mode, you can be getting files through that. So why should you really be using a CDN? Um, content is delivered quickly. Um, you don't have to rely on your own server to publish these files. Um, again, latency is cut down because of this. Um, so you will be getting quicker download in theory. A nice thing about CDNs um, is pricing is granular. It's very much um, a as you go type deal. So you only pay for what you use. Um, good examples of the uh, providers are Amazon and Rackspace Cloud. Um, Amazon has S3 buckets and Rackspace Cloud files. Um, I highly recommend Rackspace Cloud. So we have all these kind of different caching layers. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to see how these things fit in. So here's a nice diagram. Um, so as you can see on the left, uh, we have Akamai, which is the magical cloud, um, which generally handles the majority of requests to, work to HA setups and sites that are configured with Akamai. Um, if Akamai can't serve the content you've requested from its internal cache, then what it does is generally it'll pass it off to a load balancer. Um, a load balancer then decides, well, this one varnish server or this other varnish server isn't being hammered as much as the other, so I will pass it off to one of them. If then varnish can't serve that content um, from its own cache, it then passes it off to a web server. Um, and everybody should be familiar with the Apache or Nginx. So from there, what happens is Apache and PHP, Nginx will request data from MySQL or even Memcache. Um, one thing I have and messed up on my diagram is there should be arrows between the memcache and MySQL instances because you can um, you can run master slave MySQL databases. So what happens when it all goes wrong? Um, the entire world explodes. Um, <laughs> the first thing we generally hear is clients ringing up and saying, "What the hell is going on? Uh, it's it's all down." Um, at which point, try not to panic. Caching, it, because there's so many layers, you should have some coverage. Um, even the third party stuff is amazing because it will shield 99% of the anonymous traffic and even more. And vanish should in theory for the rest. So if your site is configured well, anonymous users should never know there's an issue with your site. Your entire Drupal infrastructure could be down and dead. But as far as anonymous users are concerned, they will still be seeing a fresh site, so there will be no service loss for anonymous users. When it comes to debugging um, caching, it can get a bit interesting. Um, so the best thing to do for this would be to configure different URLs. Um, so how we usually do it is we have various URLs per site, so we know that if we hit vanish.blah, then we're seeing a vanish cache. If we hit vanish.blah and log in, because we're authenticated users, we'll be bypassing um, vanish. Um, Akamai provides its own um, debugging URLs as well. Again, if you do have um, bad data in caches, don't be afraid to flush caches. 
Um, hopefully, your back end should be able to cope with it. The idea behind this is you have a stable enough server infrastructure that if caching was to fail, then you would still be able to save pages. It wouldn't be as quick, but you would still have uptime. Um, again, analyze headers. Um, curl i is a huge and very, very important tool for any, anything um, that involves caching. Um, Drupal provides its own um, headers, so if anybody's um, curl i uh, Drupal 7 site, it brings back its cache headers straight away. Um, Varnish also provides um, good headers with all the TTLs and whether it's actually coming from Varnish cache. Um, Akamai can provide header information. It doesn't by default. You have to pass it um, some extra parameters in um, HTTP header. Um, but there's, there's um, <coughs> that onto Firefox that will help with that. Another good thing to do is monitor your layout again um, with tools like iSinger, um, which is brilliant. Um, you can send off pick requests every five seconds to all the various different servers, find out if one of your Vanish servers has gone down or one of the web servers has gone. Um, this is very, very important when running HA setups that scale up and down all the time because at any one particular time you can't, you might not necessarily know how many servers are in rotation. Um, so it's always good to have a, a, a good grasp on where the point of failure is. Um, another tool that's quite useful is Pingdom just for checking the front of your site, although we tend to find that clients are very good at that. Um, they'll tend to notify you pretty quickly if the site does So, um, that's pretty much me done. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm unclear uh, how these things relate. So, um, this caching by default, <coughs> and if you install boot, how much better do you want to make it? And does that stop you as caching? Um, the nice thing about all the caching is you can just keep adding. Um, so by default, all sites should be running the Drupal default caching with page caching turned on, CSS and JS compression. Um, what Boost does is it provides just the files of the uh, actual site and that it serves without actually hitting um, the database. But then all your, all your additional caching on top of that will read from Boost. So if you were to add in Varnish like cache, Varnish would then request the page, Drupal site would serve the Boost cache of that, and then Varnish would cache that. So when somebody hits Varnish, they'll get the cache from Varnish without even touching Boost or Drupal or Apache and MySQL. So it's just kind of, kind of additional layers um, to it. <laughs> That's a highly, highly dependent um, question. It all depends on service spec, really. Um, you should see some improvement, but it depends. I, 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 it depends. 10% uh, of the minute is quite a lot of time. 10% of the second, maybe not so much. Um, in terms of your personal preference, 10% is brilliant. Any, anything where you can get an any speed boost is always better because the web now has to be served fast. The users won't engage with sites that are slow. Um, a, a great example was in Amazon a few years ago did a case study on page load times and they found that if a page loaded in over three miles, the chances are they weren't going to complete all this. So for them, it's key to have a fast site because it directly affects business. And this is the same for well, the majority of people. If the site is slow to load, the line is going to stick around. Well, if you're uh, quite new to caching and you're not very uh, good at server configuration, not too technical, uh, what would be a good place to start? Is that Boost? Um, I probably avoid Boost. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, if you need to server configuration stuff, I would say um, the Vanish module provides a default PCL file, which should be just a simple um, drop-in replacement for Vanish's default, um, which works with Drupal out of the box. Um, and kind of from there, you can sort of get a grasp on how Vanish works and sort of improve 
skills from that really. Um, I think that if you have root access to the box, then definitely varnish. One additional question. Uh, understood that varnish only works if you have a lot of memory on your server. Is that correct? Um, it depends. If you're using RAM as a storage engine, then you'll need a lot of RAM, but you can configure it to use disk. Um, so, to start out with, just use disk. Um, if you majority of like cloud service providers, um, they run fast disk storage anyway. Um, so, it'll still be fast enough for you to notice the difference. Okay.